Hi everyone, this lesson is on plantar fasciitis. In this lesson we're going to talk about why this condition occurs. We're also talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So plantar fasciitis is also known as jogger's heel or tennis heel. It is a foot condition involving recurrent heel pain. And this heel pain occurs in a particular way, which we're going to talk about when we talk about the signs and symptoms later on in this lesson. Now the etiology or the causes of this condition are actually multifactorial. Some of them include traumatic causes and some of them include issues with overuse. We're going to talk about this in more detail in the next slide. Now plantar fasciitis is actually one of the most common causes of heel pain and it may affect up to 10% of the general population. Some individuals are going to be more at risk for having plantar fasciitis depending on the types of activities they do. And other groups are more at risk for this condition as well. Females, for instance, outnumber males two to one with this condition. And there's a higher incidence of plantar fasciitis in patients with certain conditions, including spondyloarthropathies. So spondyloarthropathy conditions include ankylosing spondylitis. So if a patient has ankylosing spondylitis, there's a higher chance or a higher risk that they could also have plantar fasciitis as well. Now let's talk about the anatomy and pathophysiology of plantar fasciitis to better understand why this condition occurs and why signs and symptoms occur in plantar fasciitis. So if we were to look at the bottom of someone's foot, the anatomy we're going to look at includes what is known as the plantar aponeurosis. The plantar aponeurosis is a fibrous band of tissue that connects from the medial tubercle of the calcaneus. The calcaneus is the heel bone, connects from the medial tubercle and extends through the bottom of the foot through the arch of the foot and then separates into five bands known as digital slips or digital bands. And these five digital bands will connect to the metatarsal phalangeal joints. Now, the purpose of the plantar aponeurosis is to provide support and tension through the arch of the foot. So it acts to provide support on the underside of the foot. And the plantar aponeurosis is separated into three segments, the medial segment, the central segment, and the lateral segment. The central segment is going to be the thickest part of the plantar aponeurosis and is the part or the segment that is most commonly affected in plantar fasciitis. And more specifically, the part of the central plantar aponeurosis that's going to be most commonly affected in plantar fasciitis is the part closer to the calcaneus. And this is why we're going to see heel pain in plantar fasciitis. And this leads us into the etiologies or the causes of this condition. So the causes include overuse. So you can imagine that if you're continuously utilizing your feet in an improper way, especially, this can lead to issues in this plantar aponeurosis. So we can see issues in athletes. And in particular, we can see it when patients start to change their activities. So for instance, they could start to do more exercises. So they may have excessive exercise. So they may start to walk more or start to run more. And this could lead to damage to the plantar aponeurosis. And then another point to note here is that they may have also changed their footwear. So this can also be something to note as well. And then other potential causes include trauma. So they may have had some injury, a motor vehicle accident, for instance, or some other injury like a fall on their foot. So all of these points are going to be very important to note when taking a patient's history. So if a patient says that they've changed their activity, they start to exercise more, or they've changed their footwear, or have had some kind of injury to their foot, and then they start having this heel pain, what we're going to talk about in the next slide, this is very indicative of plantar fasciitis. So again, very key to look for these etiologies when assessing a patient's history. And along with the causes, the specific pathophysiology has to do with biomechanical dysfunction. And more specifically, it has to do with micro tears in the plantar aponeurosis. So micro tears, there can be little tears within the fibrous tissue due to repetitive use or due to some injury. And then this can lead to a degeneration of the insertion of the plantar fascia into the calcaneal tuberosity. So there can be, again, issues, especially at the insertion point of the plantar aponeurosis into the calcaneal tuberosity, so into the heel bone, and that can be where a lot of the pain can occur. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of plantar fasciitis. So the hallmark finding in plantar fasciitis is heel pain. We mentioned before it's a recurrent heel pain. It occurs in a particular way or particular pattern. 
But before we get into that particular pattern, let's talk about where it occurs more specifically. So the heel pain in plantar fasciitis is most commonly going to occur on the inferior side of the heel bone. So it's going to be on the bottom of the foot on the anterior aspect of the heel bone. So it's going to occur on the anterior part of the heel bone and it's going to occur more medially. So if we were to actually try to point to the location, it's going to most commonly occur in this location here. But having said that, it can occur in other parts of the foot as well. So it can occur in the heel, which is going to be the most common part where it's going to occur, but it can also occur in other parts of the foot as well. So if we were to look at this diagram here, as I mentioned before, the heel, more specifically the anterior heel and medial heel is going to be the most commonly affected area. But other parts of the heel can also experience pain as well. And even parts of the middle foot can also experience pain as well. And this heel pain is going to be mostly unilateral. It's going to be mostly one-sided. So one foot's going to be affected and the other one's going to be unaffected. But in some cases, it can occur bilaterally. Both feet can experience heel pain. And this occurs in roughly one-third of cases. And the pain's going to be mostly localized to the heel. But in some severe cases, the pain can radiate proximally. So instead of just having heel pain, they can also have pain that radiates up their leg. Now that we know the exact location of the pain, let's talk about how the pain feels and the pattern of how the pain occurs. So this pain is going to be a sharp and intense pain, and that heel pain is going to be elicited with the first steps in the morning. So if a patient wakes up and they start to walk on that heel, they're going to experience pain in that particular location we just talked about. Or if they've sat down for a while after prolonged inactivity, so this is going to be non-weight bearing activity, if they were to sit down and rest their foot and then start walking on that heel again, they can start experiencing pain again as well. So that's going to be key here. The first steps of their day are going to be painful. The heel is going to be painful. Or after they've sat down and had prolonged non-weight bearing activity, so that could be sitting at a desk for instance, and then once they start walking again, they can experience that heel pain again. So that is going to be key. And then what's also interesting about this pain is that the pain can slowly resolve with continued ambulation or continued walking and weight bearing on the foot. But as the day goes on, if they continue to walk or run or stand on that foot, the pain can start to worsen later. So you can see in this graph here, the first few steps are painful. And then as they continue to weight bear and continue to walk on that heel, the pain can get better. But as the day goes on, and as they've continued to walk or stand on that foot, the pain can become worse. So again, that is a characteristic finding in plantar fasciitis. Another important characteristics of this pain include the fact that the pain can improve with unloading off the affected foot. So if they start to walk and they have pain in the heel and then they lift their foot up off the ground, that can relieve the pain. And the pain can worsen with walking barefooted. So if they start to walk barefoot on certain hard surfaces, or if they start walking upstairs, that can also worsen the pain as well. So those are a couple of interesting points to note as well. And then there can be aching of the heel afterwards. So even after they have sat down and are resting, there can be some ache in the heel, or if they were to touch the heel can be sore as well. There can also be swelling of the heel in some cases, or there can be foot stiffness as well. So these can also be findings that can occur. So how do clinicians diagnose plantar fasciitis? Most commonly, it's going to be a clinical diagnosis. It's going to be by patient history and physical examination. So especially after assessing a patient history, seeing that they may have changed their activity, perhaps they're exercising more often, perhaps they're using different footwear or they're running on different hard surfaces and they start to have this recurrent heel pain that occurs in that pattern we talked about before, that can be enough to make the diagnosis. So because of that, imaging is often not necessary unless it is to rule out another condition like a fracture. So as I mentioned before, there may have been some injury to the foot in some cases. So if there's a question of a fracture, this can be important to look out for. So a plain radiograph of the foot, so a foot x-ray can be important in some cases. This could note a plantar heel spur. So a plantar heel spur doesn't necessarily mean that a patient has plantar fasciitis, but they are associated with each other. So this is what a plantar heel spur might look like. And then in some cases, ultrasound may be performed that can demonstrate a thickened, swollen plantar fascia or a plantar aponeurosis. And imaging is especially important when symptoms are refractory, meaning that the symptoms don't improve. So if there are certain treatment methods that are employed and the symptoms don't get better, imaging can be important in those cases as well. And 
in those particular cases, clinicians may go to an MRI of the foot to assess for fractures or tears or osteochondral defects. And then blood work is not going to be necessary, but it may be performed to assess for a spondyloarthropathy condition. We mentioned that spondyloarthropathy conditions increase the risk of plantar fasciitis. They are associated with one another. Now let's talk about how clinicians treat plantar fasciitis. So an important aspect of treatment is going to be rest and avoidance of the offending activity. So if there is an issue with the way a patient is exercising or their footwear, those can be things that can be changed or fixed for the patient. And the rest and avoidance of the offending activity is going to be relative to the induced pain. So if the pain is something that is elicited with certain activities, it's best to avoid those particular activities. Pain relief can also be important for these patients as well. So ice application can be a way of reducing some of the pain. And in some cases, oral or topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs like ibuprofen can be used to help treat the pain. And then in some other cases, deep friction massage of the arch of the foot and insertion point can also be helpful in reducing symptoms as well. And a lot of the treatment of plantar fasciitis is going to rely on supports. So there can be orthotics, insoles, so particular insoles that can help reduce some of the strain or burden on the plantar fascia and especially on the heel. There can be night splints, there can be heel strapping and particular stretching as well. And then in other cases where some of these more conservative measures don't work, injections may also be used. So injections like corticosteroids may be employed. Before a clinician uses corticosteroids, they need to perform a foot radiograph to ensure that there's no other condition that is causing the patient's issues. And along with corticosteroids, some other injection treatments can include injection with botulinum toxin A as well. And in some very severe and refractory cases where nothing works for the patient, including injections, surgery may be employed. So a surgical release may be utilized and may be helpful for some patients, but this is going to be a last resort. Oftentimes, a lot of these other treatments are going to be effective in treating plantar fasciitis. And what's important about all of these treatments, especially some of these conservative treatments, is that treatments occur for at least six weeks. So it's going to take some time to actually notice an improvement in symptoms. I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.